back in Spokane after a sojourn for Thanksgiving over in the holidays. Behold, replacing Darwin. And thanks again to all of the people who have helped us with the uh, Patreon over all of this time. Big thing on the screen. Um, it certainly makes a difference. We'll um, now bring my mug back on. Replacing Darwin, the bibliography that Jensen didn't think to do. Working my way through all of that, it's running out of sources that he's adding on. It's possible that it'll add a few more in the remaining section of the book that I haven't dealt with yet. So basically, we're still in the same process of working our way through those charts. Remember, we had a double whammy last week. Uh, and this time we get um, with the salamanders, and this time we get a single one. Eels, aren't they sweet? Um, Jensen put up um, eels are another one of those that is actually a broad group. Oh, hi, Barbara. Um, angle, uh, with uh, 19 families involved, which therefore means theoretically 19 kinds, but of course he's only dealing with one, uh, which is... Um, uh, has a fairly a complete listing. He's got 17 dots, uh, but again, he has them appearing in a relatively tight time frame, uh, 600 years after the flood. Let me see if I can get that little chart here to show you. It's always amusing to see how he thinks to structure things. There we go. Next week, I think, is the last of his charts. The, uh, there we go, right over here. Boop, boop, boop. Eels, isn't that wonderful? Um, he has appearing about 600 years after the flood, which would be bringing us down to about 1750 BCE. Uh, why so? Well, it's possible because eels were another group that were fairly well known to ancient peoples and it's built into their systems rather nicely. Um, trying to figure out how that would relate to the actual uh, biological data is quite a different uh, kettle of fish. And of course, as usual, he didn't cite any sources on it. So uh, we've got a very nice little paper on uh, the eels generally from Santini 2013, which went through all of their various systematics. Um, little puppy, which I'll be putting a link to. And um, then the issue of uh, the fossils. Uh, there's not a huge amount of eel fossils, but we, they do go back to at least 83 million years. And the family Jensen is playing with comes along around 44 million years ago, uh, per the dating by uh, uh, friends in uh, 2005, which is um, uh, a little paper on um, uh, the mesal formation, which uh, is kind of interesting because, of course, that's another one of those cute little Lagerstätten. <laughs> Uh, and relatively recent um, in that respect. That's post Cretaceous. Now, remember, there's that big ongoing debate about in, within the, well, not a gigantic debate, with ICR bunch arguing for a really late boundary for the flood to include all of the fossils that look like fossils. Um, and that would include things like mesal. Um, but in the normal creationist perspective, like you would find over at Answers in Genesis, theoretically, it should be post-flood. So what the hell's going on in there? Anyway, um, we've got um, another little sidebar that comes up uh, with relating to their transoceanic dispersal. So I'm going to be putting up a paper from McDowell from 1998 uh, on uh, some Australian to New Zealand uh, transfers. Biogeography again. Remember, Australia and New Zealand are not terribly close to Ararat. So did all these little eels still exist in the freshwater environment and then the flood came along and the salinity level went what sets and what the heck is going on? You're not going to get any of that information from uh, uh, any creationist because they can't get to the point where they can think that through very well enough. Now, the other part of the show relates to um, a relatively new posting uh, from Toonstra on... Um, um, a very new paper on um, cephalopod origins. And that little puppy, um, Lucien Twinstra is kind of starting, he's a new figure in the creationism biz. Hello, Brian, night morning, um, where he's going on the earliest ancestors of the cephalopods. Uh, and uh, the problem 
with somebody actually citing a technical paper is, especially one that's open access, is you can read the bloody thing. And more importantly, you can see all the delicious little details that said paper has on breaking down the details of the particular group that they're referring to. Um, what this turned out to be is the case of a um, um, Carboniferous era fossil, uh, which had retained the ancestral 10 arm condition before you get off to the eight arm models, which currently have. Now, as far as the creationist is concerned, it had to have been destroyed in the flood. And just because you're losing something, that doesn't, it means it's not really evolution. So, um, with that rationalization, they just go off the deep end. Oh, uh, <laughs> ooh. One of my deep sea cam channels had a new cephalopod, still not named. They are sure, not sure exactly where to put it taxonomically. You want to bet that the regular systematics will beat the creationists to the punch on this one, which again goes into the issue of how many kinds were there? How many kinds of eels were there? How many kinds of these cephalopods are there? Um, how do they break down what was happening um, uh, during the creation week? Uh, are the fossil examples of them all derived nondescriptly um, with um, pure um, variation within a kind? Um, and how do you draw the line between an ancestral 10-armed one and its 10-armed cousins? Is the creationist going to do that? No, probably not. And so this is one of the things that's so fascinating about watching uh, creationists discussing systematics is it's useless. It's useless up here in the sense that the creationist makes no attempt whatsoever to think through, to apply their model, to generate insight as to what's connected to what and what features are related to what. It's just, oops, God did it at some point. Uh, in creation week, don't bother us about it. It's a kind, kind of, sort of, we're not going to bother about the details. Um, he didn't even have any creationists to cite on this point in the same reason that uh, uh, Jensen didn't have anything to cite on uh, uh, eels. That um, aquatic creatures in general are mentioned as gee whiz items. Look at feature X, how amazing this is and what a wonderful creator the creator is. Uh, and beyond that, virtually nothing. Um, yes, yes, indeed, not useless. Um, okay, practically useless in the sense that it, it is useful for rationalization. It makes them feel better. It makes them feel like they've explained something, uh, but it makes no impact on anything. It doesn't alter any of the actual facts, and it doesn't lead to any insight on subsequent facts. So anyway, anybody who is terribly in the eels and cephalopods will be able to watch as we move down through the years to see whether or not any creationist ever gets to the point where they deal with that. Invertebrates in general, whether marine forms or insects, are not terribly easy to systematize from a creationist point of view. Um, let alone working out the biogeography things, because they're not on the ark, um, then you don't have to bother about thinking about them. So their brains don't think about them. They're, so at that stage, they think about them exactly the same way that intelligent designers think about everything, <laughs> because they don't have an ark to book. So they don't think about them at all. Uh, creationists are forced by the structure of the ark concept and the fact that there was a creation event that was only... 1500 years before the flood, uh, that they would have to sort them out somehow or other. But they eventually are going to start bogging down, as we've been showing week after week after week after week after week on this thing, that they have to miss the genetics. They've got to miss the paleontology. They have to miss the biogeography and the little details of the biology and all the connections that has. Uh, to deal with. Whereas the regular scientists, bit by bit, sort out, restructure, clarify, improve, lead to new things. And when you find new things like new cephalopods, um, the evolutionist is going to try to work out how it fits systematically into other groups. 
is it close to this one versus that one, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, if it's an existing example and they can get the little bits on the DNA, uh, then they can uh, apply all of those tools. Uh, you're never going to see the creationists get to that stage. No matter how many years they have to work with it, no matter how many people think they can deal with some of the things, they could rearrange the deck chairs or compress the data field to fit the flood uh, scenario. And that's as much as they can do. Uh, so it, it'll be an amusing thing to think about. Um, needless to say, in Rocks for There, Volume 2, we're going to be putting in all that sort of information. Going through all of those charts has been useful because it's been an indicator of what gets Jensen's attention and, more importantly, what doesn't. And how, even as of 2017 and now five years later, that there's just no body of analytical work that they can draw on uh, to make any sense out of any of this stuff. Um, some of it would be um, running in niches where you've got um, uh, particular groups of creationists who cover just a particular little zone as their obsession, but there's other creationists who would disagree about the details of things. That's what happens with human evolution as, just, uh, as to have such confusion about Homo erectus and Homo habilis and Neanderthal and all the rest to try to figure out how they're going to sort all of that in there. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, oh, they've named it now uh, uh, Grandpa Toothis Imperator. Ooh, okay. It, it must be a pretty f um, a ferocious little critter. Oh, we do not want air. Windows updating again. It's, we don't want to do that. It's going to try to do... Yikes. I just can't stand it when this thing decides to do its little update in the middle of things. Um, okay. Uh, we've been on about 12 minutes. I'll be putting all the links in there. We're going to let the stupid thing do its bloody little update uh, in the middle of things because by the time I figure a time to get into it, then we're, it's going to be seeing me fiddle with things on the screen. So um, we'll uh, shut down for uh, the time. We'll be back on next week. Uh, we'll deal with the sharks, which is going to be by uh, a gap, a gigantic hole in the argument because the sharks, the Convict these are mammoth in terms of how many connections they have and how many potential family groups and evolutionary relationships and that they have on there. So um, uh, the fact that that he's got one measly little family that he's going to be introducing and no sources relevant to them, um, I'll, I'll check to make sure in his reference bibliography to find out. Um, it's, it's going to be a, an amusing time to deal with. Okay, so we'll be shutting things down on this short show today. We'll hit you again next week, and we'll also uh, have a more funky time in December because of the amount of time I'll be spending over um, with my relatives in the holidays, so that'll make it dicier about some of the shows. But anyway, have uh, hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving. Hope they're in a comfortable state and where you are, uh, and uh, we will see you all next week, and I'm going to restart the stupid